welcome back everybody so this is uh, sadly our last week it always feels strange when the semester is over but i guess you guys are getting pretty fed up with uh, 14 15 weeks of lectures and then you want to wrap up things in terms of exams and, and projects or whatever so the um, uh, last week we uh, didn't have lectures due to the uh, quantum computing school and uh, what I'm trying to do this week is in a way to catch up a little bit. Uh, we are going to go through copper cluster theory, but we're also going to um, repeat some of the things which we have um, done and link these things together. So the um, uh, I wanted to give you a kind of uh, um, overarching uh, motivation for what is coming with copper cluster theory and how that links with what we have done previously. Now, uh, there are some repetition slides, uh, which mainly deal about us defining a new vacuum state and diagram rules. And then I'm going to use a little bit the slides uh, from copper cluster theory. Uh, but before we do that, I thought of just jumping into the uh, uh, whiteboard and remind you of uh, some of the results we had from uh, full configuration interaction theory and money body perturbation theory and Hartree Fox theory and how copper cluster theory links with that, and how you can see uh, copper cluster theory as a kind of unitary or similarity transformation of your Hamiltonian matrix. So uh, let's uh, uh, dive into the uh, uh, whiteboard. Uh, but before we do that, just I want just to remind you that you can find the slides here. So these are PDF files, and uh, I haven't used the standard format because uh, there were so many diagrams to include and videos and latex commands, which I was not able to translate properly into uh, math jacks. So these are just regular PDF files. Okay, let's just uh, switch here to the uh, to the whiteboard. So the um, uh, what we did in when we derived the equations for full configuration interaction theory, so let's quickly remind ourselves about that. We uh, looked at a what we called a non-efficient way of solving the equations. So if we look at the FCI calculations, we had a ground state, which we could uh, write out as a linear combination of Slater determinants. And uh, this linear combination would now, in principle, be a sum from uh, the ground state ansatz to infinity. So we would have a set of uh, overlap coefficients which describe a unitary transformation mm -hmm. in terms of these uh, slate, set of Slater determinants, which we can build up easily. Now, one of the things which we did was to rewrite these uh, uh, linear combinations in terms of uh, particle hole excitations. So we had a more compact notation where we summed over what we called uh, uppercase P. So this P here could be zero particle hole represent, uh, excitations. It could be a one particle, one hole. It could be a two particle, two hole. If we have N particles, this is N particle, N hole excitations. And if we don't put any truncation on the single particle basis, it means that we would have an infinity of one particle, one hole, two particle, two hole, et cetera, excitations. So the kind of compact notation was in terms of this coefficient CHP. And then we had a uh, Slater determinant, uh, which represented particle hole excitations. And then we defined the zero particle, zero hole excitation. That is something which we uh, use an ansatz to define. And this also defines our new vacuum state. So you can think of this as a computational vacuum state. So it may not be the true vacuum state or reference state, but it's the, our computational reference state, which often is given by a handy basis. And what we also had is that acting with this specific Hamiltonian here on this state, this was given in terms of a W0 multiplied with phi zero. So we assume that these Slater determinants are uh, form an eigenbasis for the uh, un, what we call the unperturbed Hamiltonian, or where we don't have the two-body interaction or more complicated interactions. And then we define this one particle, one hole excitation 
that was given in terms of these states i for the states below the Fermi level and a, a for above the Fermi level. And this will be given by an A, A dagger, A I, acting on this vacuum state, which we sometimes also rewrote in a more compact notation in terms of this C here. And this state C, <clears throat> phi zero, will then be given by a Slater determinant or the representation in second quantization from one up to n, the number of particles which we have. And these fill the lowest lying single particle states. And then we have an A, I, dagger, acting on the true vacuum. So these are just repetitions. And what we could do then was to rewrite uh, using something which is called, is a trick, which is called intermediate normalization. So we put that coefficient C0 to one. So that's a zero particle, zero whole one. And then we could rewrite the uh, answers for the, or the, the true ground state uh, as an expansion of this orthonormal basis. And we would have then a phi zero plus, and then we had a sum over a i, and then we had an a i, a, no, a a dagger multiplied with the uh, phi zero state and multiplied again with a c i a so these are the coefficients and then we had a two particle two hole excitation so this was the one particle one hole excitation then we have the two particle two hole excitations which then run over single particle states a and b above the fermi level and i and j below the fermi level and then we would have an a a dagger a b dagger a j a i acting on this vacuum state multiplied with this coefficient c i j and c a b here and this goes up all the way up to the final sum where i just write a b i j and this corresponds now to the n particle n hole excitations this was just a way to rewrite this infinite series of slater determinants now when we then diagonalized we would obtain these coefficients. And we could then define uh, the correlation energy with a two-body interaction only. So with a, a two-body Hamiltonian interaction only. Then we could define this one to be equal to the exact energy minus this energy, which we call the reference energy. And this is equal to uh, the true energy for the ground state minus this reference energy, which would then be given by this W0 plus this term, which run over, runs over all these single particle states below the Fermi level. And then we had an IJ, VIJ, and this is an anti-symmetrized matrix element. And we could now, if we stopped at a uh, interaction, which is only a, a two-body interaction, which lets two particles interact at the time, the same time, then this would now be given by a sum over AI. I would have these coefficients CIA. And then uh, what I would have next would be the matrix elements of this operator F which we defined, let me just bring it back again, plus a term here, which now runs over the two particle, two hole excitations. So we would have a coefficient C I, C I J A B. And then we had a matrix element, I J V A B anti-symmetrized. So this was the case when we did the expansions and set and looked at the, uh, the so-called correlation energy, we could then define that in terms of only two of the coefficients. However, when you diagonalize, then you have an, a mixture into these coefficients from three particle, three hole, four particle, four hole, et cetera, et cetera. So the full diagonalization gives the non-linearity in these coefficients. Now, when we did Hartree-Fock theory, what happened then 
is that we could actually zero out those coefficients. But let's now remind ourselves about the typical Hamiltonian matrix, which we ended up with, because I want to link this with uh, what we are going to do in, in copper cluster theory. And uh, I guess you remember that one, and I'm going to bring this up again in the slides pretty soon. So the Hamiltonian matrix uh, is now given in terms of a set of matrix elements. So we had a zero particle, zero whole block. We had a one particle, one whole block, two particle, two whole block. There's a three particle, three particle, three whole block, etc., up to n particle, n whole here. And we have then uh, the same here on the rows, in the rows, one particle, one hole, two particle, two holes, three particles, three hole, etc., down to n particle, n hole. So let me just quickly remind you about the structure of this matrix. So we would have matrix elements which are non-zero here. We can have non-zero here, non-zero here. But since we only had a two-particle interaction, then that means that all these matrix elements are zero. Similarly, we would have non-zero here, non-zero here, the matrix is Hermitian, and then all the rest will be zeros. Here, in, on the other hand, we can couple up to three particle, three whole excitations. So that means that two uh, single particle states can be different on the bra or the ket side. And then the uh, other matrix elements here, which are non-zero, are given by these. So here we can couple with four particle, four whole. This would be a zero. And this will be zero again. And then the three particle, three whole can also couple to a five particle, five whole. And then in the rest are zero. And this just continue, sorry, this continues. And this two particle, two whole can couple with four particle, four whole. But then we have zeros. And this one can couple with five particle, five whole. And the rest are zeros. And then the we just write it like this, and then we have zeros along the way. So as we said, what we have is a kind of matrix, which is uh, what we would call block diagonal, where we have a, uh, if we have many particles, it means that the matrix will be very sparse. If we have few particles, it will, on the other hand, it could be a dense matrix. However, the uh, the uh, density of uh, the different subblocks here, this is something which is not given a priori. So we just mark it with an X to indicate that these matrix elements are non-zero. Now, what we uh, did next when we run a Hartree-Fock calculation, so let's quickly remind ourselves about that. So when we diagonalize, the eigenvectors in the diagonalization give us these coefficients. So you would diagonalize, and clearly then you have the energy, so you don't need to calculate the correlation energy. But you can always look at the correlation energy and set it up because that's very useful as a benchmark compared with other methods. So when you're now dealing with project with the second midterm, uh, the, the problem you have is a six by six matrix, which you can easily diagonalize. And then you can find the correlation energy. And then you can compare that with many body perturbation theory. So when we did the Hartree Fock calculation, what we ended up with then in principle. <laughs> is that this uh, can be viewed as a transformation, as a unitary transformation. So it can be seen as a unitary transformation where we zero out The blocks, or just let's write it the block, which connects the ground state, zero particle, zero hole excitations, with the Hamiltonian, with the one particle, one hole block. So that led to uh, these coefficients, uh, CIA, to be equal to zero. So we have just performed a similarity transformation. So that what that means with our, our matrix, let me just rewrite it. It means that when we look now at the zero particle, zero hole, the one particle, one hole block, 
two particle, two hole, etc. Now I'm just gonna look at these one particle, one hole, two particle, two hole, etc. What happens then is that this block now is transformed. So we get the transform matrix elements. This is zero, and this is zero, and this is transformed. This is transformed. All the other matrix elements are now being transformed. And in this case, I can also link with a free particle free hole. This will still be zero. This will be non-zero. It links also with a free particle free hole and a four particle four hole. And then we would have zeros, etc. So the whole thing now is that what you see is that we have zero out a specific block of the Hamiltonian matrix, which is this block here. And the hope then is that the uh, these different blocks couple weakly, so that the hartree fock calculation is a good approximation, meaning that the matrix element with, between the zero particle hole and the two particle two hole states is hopefully smaller than what we had before. This normally leads to a faster convergence, not only for the matrix eigenvalue, a solution, but also for other many body methods. So this is the way we can link the Hartree-Fock theory with the, the full configuration interaction theory. And normally people would start doing a full configuration interaction theory calculation using Hartree-Fock basis. Another thing which we noted when we did this is that we could define a generalized Slater determinant which now uh, represents these uh, Hartree-Fock basis states, which we could rewrite as an exponential. And I'm going to rewrite this in terms of an operator T1 and multiplied with the original Slater determinant. And this is something which is called Thaulis theorem. And this... Uh, T1, this operator, is just a sum over the coefficient CIA. And then I have an AI, A, A. So these are the operators which we have. And this is an operator which now uh, mixes one particle, one whole excitations. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now, the um, uh, just keep this in mind. And when we went to many body perturbation theory, MBPT, there the correlation energy, as we defined it, this delta E MBPT was given by the exact energy minus this W0. And that is then given in terms of the sum over all the contributions from first order to in principle infinity of delta uh, E of i here and where we have delta e of one which was simply the contribution from the in this specific case this would now be the term which we have seen before ij and this is a sum over all the contributions from below the fermi level then we had a money body perturbation theory to second order and if we now use a hartree fock basis what happens then with a Hartree-Fock basis? Then we could just limit ourselves to a specific contribution, which is one divided by four. And then we have A, B, I, J. And then we have the sum over I, J, V. And now I'm gonna skip this anti-symmetrized symbol. And then we have an A, B, or V of I, J. And this is then divided by epsilon I, plus epsilon j minus epsilon a minus epsilon b. That was the second order. And the thing which is interesting now, as we discussed with money body perturbation theory, is that money body perturbation theory uh, builds up in a perturbative way these coefficients which you see here. So if we now go back to this specific coefficient here, money body perturbation theory gives an approximation to the exact diagonalization coefficient. And this is something which, uh, when you play around with this pairing model, the reason for why this pairing model uh, 
has so many interesting pedagogical aspects is that you can tune the interaction. And then what you will see is that when you tune the interaction and you make it weaker, then your money body perturbation theory results will become closer to what you get from exact diagonalization. But it's not only the interaction, it's also the uh, ratio between the single particle states and the interaction. So if you now look at the, the second midterm, so let's just bring that up, midterm two. Then what we have decided is that the matrix elements, I, J, V, A, B, are just given by a constant minus G. So then everything simplifies. So that means that delta E of two then is just equal to this one over four and then multiply with g squared. And then I have a sum over a, b, i, j. And the only thing which you need to do then is to set in the single particle energies. And the single particle energy is also simple because they're just given by a constant spacing, which is a parameter d. And then you simply need to plug that in. So that means that what you will get there will just be one over multiply of d. when you're setting up uh, money body perturbation theory to second order. So the only thing you actually need to evaluate is this one. And if you have, for instance, uh, this specific case here, so this is the Fermi level, we have a two particle system, a four part, sorry, a four particle system with spin up, spin up here. So this would be the ground state, phi zero. And uh, you could now assume that the I and J could be in the lowest line state. You can put that by convenience to zero. You can always set the scale, so you start at zero. And then you could assume that the A and B, they could now be in this state. So that means that you get uh, an energy difference where these two are given by zero because you put the scale to zero. And then you have minus these two guys. And so one of them is 2D and the other one will be 2D if they are here. And you can only keep uh, track of uh, states which where you don't break a pair. So that's the whole assumption with the model that no pairs are broken. So that means that an excitation which you would get, a typical one, could be an excitation of this type here. And if we put that to zero, and this to 1D and 2D and 3D, this is up to you, how you, how you label the single particle energies then you see clearly that the denominator would then be equal to 1 over 4d in that case. And then you can look at the next excitation, and then you can also think of you placing these two here and exciting these two up. So then these two would already have 1d plus 1d, 2d. And then you simply need to take the difference between the other ones. So the ratio between these denominators and this the strength of the interactions is what is going to uh, decide how well money body perturbation theory behaves compared to full configuration interaction theory. So what we uh, end up with then is a uh, set of, uh, uh, how to say, analytical expression for second order. You will also have for third order. It's not so difficult to set up the equations. You can easily write a program if you want to. And the, uh, uh, the thing now is that the coefficients which we have here is that this coefficient C, I, J, A, B is now approximated with to second order. So we should put second order here, two here, is approximated by the interaction A, B, V, I, J. This is an anti-symmetrized matrix element. And then we would keep the factor one over four because we're going to treat this later as an operator, epsilon i plus epsilon j minus epsilon a minus epsilon b. And you see that the coefficients are dimensionless, so you have energy divided by energy as it should be. So this is uh, so far so good. And then you would get, when you go to third order, you will get similar contributions to, the, uh, uh, to these coefficients. And if you are able to sum many body perturbation, perturbation theory to infinite order, then you should actually be able to get the same as you would get with exact diagonalization. 
So these are the kind of links which we are going to make. Now, what we are going to define now is an operator, which I'm going to label as a T1. We define this T1 as a sum, but I'm going to slightly rewrite it in order to make a distinction between what we had in full configuration interaction theory and what is going to come now, which is going to be copper cluster theory. So this is a, normally called an amplitude. So these quantities here are called amplitudes because as we saw in many body perturbation theory, these are actually proportional to the wave operator to a given order. So this quantity here, I'll just leave it in a more generic way without specifying it. And then we have an A, A dagger and AI. Then I'm going to define my next operator, which is a T2. And it shouldn't be a surprise that you have a A, B, I, J. And then I'm going to have an amplitude T, I, J, A, B. And then I'm going to have an A, I, A, B, A, J, A, I. So this is a one particle, one hole excitation. This is a two particle, two hole excitation. And then I can continue like this till I get to a T of N, which is now an operator which goes like N factorial squared. And this contains an excitation which now involves all the particles, A, B, C, D, etc., up to N uh, particle excitations, and I, J, K, L, etc., and this will contain a string of such amplitudes, A, J, I, J, K, L, etc., A, B, C, D, etc. And then we're going to have a chain of creation and annihilation operators, A, B, and then we have an A, J, A, I, etc. And this is going to represent an n particle n hole. Now, motivated by Thole's theorem, uh, there is something which is now, and, and you can actually prove that this represents the exact wave function. So it's called the exponential ansatz. So I can now rewrite the exact wave function for the ground state in terms of a, an operator E of t which is now going to act on the ground state here. And this T contains a summation of all these operators of T1. So this is the one particle, one hole excitation. And then I have the two particle, two hole, plus a three particle, three hole excitation operator, et cetera, et cetera, up to T of N here. And you can show that this actually corresponds to the same thing which we put up before, but, but this is a series which is reorganized. And you can see that you sum this to infinite order due to the exponential character. So what you have, pre what we had previously was actually this uh, uh, operation where we had one plus this operator C acting on the ground state, phi zero, the ansatz. And in, this is in FCI, this C, which we call the correlation operator, contained now these coefficients C, I, A. And then we had A, I, A, A plus, and then we had the C, I, J, A, B, A, J, A, I, up to N particle N hole. So when you diagonalize, what you obtain then is obviously the exact coefficients here, which represents these different uh, slated determinants. And with the exponential ansatz, and you can actually, for the Thule's theorem, you can show that this is correct. For the other ones, it's a little bit more involved proof. But this uh, uh, statement here simply means that what you can do now is to rewrite your wave functions in terms of uh, these types of operators. The benefit here, however, if you now look at money body perturbation theory, if we go down a little bit here, you see that money body perturbation theory introduces a correction to these coefficients order by order. 
So that means that you really have to go to infinite order to get the exact term. Now, when you have this exponential ansatz, what you can do then is to sum specific correlations to infinite order. If you now think of the expansion of your exponential, this gives you 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial, x cubed divided by 3 factorial, etc., etc. So that means that you're taking now into account these wave operators, exponentiated, or these terms here, exponentiated and summed to infinite order. So that gives you, compared to many body perturbation theory, to second order here, where you only stop at this term, you can actually sum to infinite order a set of specific correlations. So copper cluster theory, compared to uh, many body perturbation theory, is a more systematic way to include correlations to infinite order. Now, if you now look at this expansion, which we did here, this specific one, where we take the exact wave operators, that means that we, in principle, we have a as difficult problem as the full diagonalization case, because we have to deal with up to n particle n whole excitations. So if you go back a little bit to what we did in full configuration interaction theory, where we rewrote the equations in an inefficient way, you found that we had expressions for the coefficients, which then for the two particle two hole, you had a dependence from three particle three hole and four particle four hole. So you had to have solve equations for all the types of coefficients in order to uh, find the same coefficients which you would get by diagonalization. Now, what we're going to do now is to make a truncation here. So a classical truncation is something which is called the singles and doubles. So that means that I take this operator, which now corresponds to all the possible excitations I can make. And I just approximate that with T1 plus T2. If I do T1 only, then I'm going to have something which is related to Thule's theorem. So that will only involve one particle, one whole excitations. If I only do T2, then I'm going only to deal with two particle, two whole excitations. So if I'm already in a Hartree-Fock basis, there will be one particle, one whole excitations in the scheme here, which will actually have to be zero. So that will simplify the type of excitations which we get. So this leads now, now to a uh, ansatz for the ground state, which is given by E to the T1 plus T2, these operators acting on phi zero. This is one of the standard uh, copper cluster expressions. And what we are going to do now is the following. So we are going to rewrite the Hamiltonian matrix in terms of a modified Hamiltonian so that we can actually zero out matrix elements in the Hamiltonian matrix. And what you're going to see pretty soon is that the matrix elements we will zero out are matrix elements of this type and this type. So we are going to set up a set of equations. Let me just bring this up here. So with this T1 and T2, we need to solve two types of equations. Sorry. So we are going to get an equation for the correlation energy, which is going to be given by the exact energy minus E0 ref. And if we stay with a two-body interaction only, this is going to be equal not to the coefficient C of I, but it's going to be equal to these coefficients T I A. And then I'm going to have this matrix elements I with this operator f of i plus a sum over a, b, i, j 
where I now have T, I, J, A, B, and then I have I, J, or V, A, B, anti-symmetrized. Then I'm going to get a new equation where I'm going to zero out the one particle, one whole matrix elements with a similarity transformed Hamiltonian. So I'm going to put a bar here, and then I'm going to define that a little bit later, what that Hamiltonian is, with zero particle, zero hole, so which is actually our ground state. So we can rewrite this one as a one particle, one hole of H of phi zero, and we want that one to be zero. So that will give us a set of equations. And then, so that would be equation two. So this is the first equation. Then we have the second equation. This equation is going to give us the expressions for these coefficients t, i, a. And then I need a new expression for the coefficients which we have here between two particle, two hole, and the similarity transformed Hamiltonian and the ground state. And we want that also to be zero. So this gives us, gives a recipe for finding TIA. This gives a recipe for finding TIJ A or B. Now these are going to be nonlinear equations in the unknown parameters. So the way this is going to be solved is that we are going to solve this in, a, in an iterative way. So we would start with a guess for this energy, this one, because that energy will enter these equations as well. And then as a guess for the first amplitudes we have here, we are going to use many body perturbation theory to second order. And then we have an expression for these, and then we can start iterating. Then you get the expressions for the Tij's and the Tia's from solving these two equations here. You go back, you calculate the energy, and then you keep iterating till this energy doesn't change by a prefix constant. So that's the basics of uh, what is going to come now. And then we need to deal with the uh, practical equations which we're getting. But the recipe, the kind of overarching picture now, is that we are going to develop an iterative scheme. And in order to see the wood for the trees, I'm going to remind you of the less practical way of solving the FCI calculations, which we did in the middle of September, beginning of October. Because then we rewrote the FCI uh, Hamiltonian matrix and solved that in terms of uh, nonlinear equations for the unknown coefficients. So I'm just going to remind you of that so you see how, where these equations come from. Now, the way we are going to define this operator is that we are going to let this be a non-Hermitian operator. Mm -hmm. So that's a drawback. Many body perturbation theory is also non-Hermitian theory, so it can converge from below or from above. So that's you're not guaranteed that it will respect the variational principle. The reason why uh, we opt for a non-Hermitian theory here is because this uh, expansion which you see here, when that acts together with the Hamiltonian, this expansion can be truncated at the order of specific nested commutators. So if you have a two-body interaction, these nested commut commutators can be truncated at the order of four nested commutators. So it truncates. And that means that you have an explicit number of equations to solve. If you uh, wish to have the full hermeticity, then your transformation becomes a unitary transformation. And then uh, with a unitary or orthogonal transformation, then this tr expansion in terms of commutators does not truncate. So you would actually have to have an infinite series of nested commutators. I'm coming back to that a little bit later. So there's a lot of, many of these many body methods, they contain a lot of uh, interesting mathematics, uh, which we are going to scratch the surface a little bit about. So uh, one of the things I want to do before we uh, stretch legs a little bit is actually to remind you of these equations which you see here and the way we wrote them in FCI theory. 
So let me just bring back that just to stop sharing here. And then take a look at uh, some slides which we had some time ago. So let's just go back here. And we had the, in the FCI calculations, we looked at the, what we call full configuration interaction theories. And I think it should be this one. Uh, no, this was the Hartree Fox. So it was the week before, actually, week 39. So what we did then, when we had uh, rewritten the uh, uh, problem in terms of uh, a full Hamiltonian matrix, what we did was actually to define something which we call a non-practical way of solving the eigenvalue problem. So we defined the states like that, and we had the uh, Hamiltonian minus the energy acting on that, and we want that to be zero. So we rewrote everything in terms of the reference energy, which now contains this equation here, which we put up in the beginning of this lecture. And the way you can do this now is to multiply that equation. If you take the first one and multiply with phi zero, that will be the first row in your Hamiltonian matrix. That gives you this term. If you then multiply it with uh, uh, the next term, a one particle, one whole state, which is the next row, then you and you want this to be zero, when you just reshuffle the equations, this is equal to zero. That contains something which links with a free particle, free whole excitation. Now, what we are going to do now in this copper cluster approximation is to actually put this up, or this term here to zero. So we're just going to keep one particle, one hole, and two particle, two holes. So that's already an approximation. So we have left out free particle, free hole excitations. This what you see here is the equation, the non-practical way of rewriting the FCI equations, where we keep all the excitations. And then what you see here is that when you reshuffle it, you have this term here. And if you don't know how to fork calculation, this term is zero. And then you have uh, these matrix elements, which we can all calculate. And we have an expression for the unknown coefficient CIA which we, we then can isolate because you have it here and you have it here. You know the expression for the energy, which you can plug in because that would be your exact energy given by the unperturbed or the reference energy plus delta E. So you would plug that one in. In the iterative scheme, you would plug, plug that one in here. And typically what people will do then is to make an ansatz for these coefficients using money body perturbation theory which is actually the operator, the money body perturbation theory operator to first order. So if I were to look at one particle, one whole excitation to second order in the energy, I would have this term here. So what you would do then is simply to uh, start this in an iterative way where you have an initial guess for these terms. And then you keep obtaining new values. You get a... Uh, new values for the coefficients C, I, A, and you need a similar equation for these. So if you look at these, then you're multiplying from the left, your Schrodinger equation. We have Hamiltonian minus the energy, so that should be equal to zero, as you see here. Now you multiply from the left with that one, and then you get a new set of equations, a nonlinear equation in the unknown coefficients, but where you now also have four particle for whole excitations. So in the full case, you would then get rows with uh, two particle, two hole coefficients, three particle, three hole coefficients, four particle, four hole, et cetera, et cetera. What we are doing now is to truncate the type of excitations to only two particle, two hole. So that means that with the approximation we've made, these terms disappear, these terms disappear. And that means that we can limit ourselves to look at only one particle, one hole, and two particle, two hole excitations. And here again, when you want to find the solution to this problem, you can then start with the, uh, a choice, which is dictated by second order perturbation theory. And you could actually solve these equations here in FCI, 
in a non-practical way by instead of diagonalizing, just solving these equations in an iterative way. So that's uh, just an alternative. It's not very practical. It uh, introduces many more floating point operations, but it can be done. Now in copper cluster theory now, just to see the, the similarities, is that we are going, when we limit the uh, type of operators to only one particle, one hole, and two particle, two hole excitations, it means that we are zeroing out many of these coefficients. And we only deal with these equations. So what we can do then is in practice, what we are dealing with, if you look at the one particle, one hole terms, we are going to drive this equation to zero. By just, if you reshuffle this to the other side, you have this equal to zero. So what that corresponds to is you taking your Hamiltonian minus E and you multiply with this one particle, one whole of state. So this is just to remind you a little bit of uh, how you can interpret what is going to come with copper cluster theory now. Should we stretch legs a little bit to do that? So there was a question uh, during the break, which I think is a little bit important because uh, I presented this uh, diagonalization recipe here where we start with a full matrix like this. And then the question was, what does it actually mean that you're zeroing out matrix elements? What, what is happening? And I think that's a little bit important because I like this link between FCI and the other methods when we deal with uh, a Hartree-Fock basis. So when you think of the diagonalization problem, if you now just go down here to what I wrote during the break, and you look at the, the uh, diagonalization problem itself. So what you have, uh, we have a standard eigenvalue problem here. We know that uh, the way you actually solve this numerically with linear algebra methods is that you perform orthogonal or unitary transformations of your matrix. So your matrix is obviously symmetric. It's a quadratic matrix, it can be Hermitian. And the uh, uh, it's a square matrix. And we know that uh, uh, if you find such a magic uh, transformation, your matrix can become diagonal. And then you can just read off the eigenvalues. And the way this is normally done is that you act on your matrix A, A with this unitary transformation. So that means that you actually perform a transformation on your basis. So you get a new vector. And then you can insert the orthogonality relation or unitarity relation for the matrices. With, this is just equal to one. So that means that if this happens, then you have a matrix D, which is diagonal, and you have the eigenvectors. And what you see is that these transformations, they obviously preserve the eigenvalues, but they change the eigenvectors. Changing the eigenvectors means also that you change the value of the matrix elements. So clearly, this matrix elements lambda 1 is not the same as the original diagonal matrix element, right? So the, uh, uh, however, finding such a magic S is not given unless you have a very simple case which can be separated easily. So that means that the standard recipe is that you apply a series of such transformations. So what you could think of then is that Hartree-Fock could now be just S1 here. So with Hartree-Fock then, then you would zero out this guy and this guy. And then you would get a change matrix element. So if you look at this one, you could perhaps, when you do the transformation now, maybe you zero out these two guys here. And the easiest way to think of that is if you take a two by two matrix and you look at Jacobi's method, where you're just transforming the vector around a coordinate system. And then the way you, you set these non-diagonal matrix equal to zero is to select a vector here no, it's not a vector, sorry, a, an angle theta. When you perform the multiplications, the matrix, matrix, matrix multiplications, what you do then is that you require that your non-diagonal matrix element are zero, and that fixes the value of the angle theta. 
And then you can keep repeating this. In this case, you will just have in one shot, you have immediately a diagonal matrix. So when we now are setting up these equations, this is essentially the kind of philosophy we are dealing with. So if we go back then to what we put up before the break, uh, when we do Hartree-Fock theory, we now get a modified matrix element here. And then we have zero out this. So you can think of Hartree-Fock theory. And Hartree-Fock theory is uh, an orthogonal transformation. It observes the variational principle because we have a transformation now which leads to a new Hermitian matrix. And now we'll just zero out this little block here. The hope is always that then the coupling between this one and that one and this one and that one is weak. And similarly with this one and that and these one with that. So that perhaps we could even now uh, diagonalize a problem which only includes the two particle two whole blocks. So that could, would be the ideal. So in a full, uh, in configuration interaction theory, you can make such truncations where you now just leave out these. In that case, you uh, leave out three particle, three whole, four particle, four whole excitations. And that's normally called configuration interactions at singles and doubles level. Then you can get more ambitious. You can include the three particle, three whole. And that means you would diagonalize this block, hoping that the rest plays a small role. And that leads to CI, SDT, T for triples. And then you can obviously go four particle, four hole, you have quadruples. So then you get CI, SDT, Q, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are some subtle problems here, which are more topics for an advanced, more advanced many body physics course that you actually produce unlinked diagrams when you do that which means that you will have a non-physical dependence on the number of particles. But this is something we are leaving out. Then uh, the copper cluster theory has uh, its merits and its uh, uh, negative aspects. The negative aspect is that you can uh, perform a truncation here when we look at the transformed Hamiltonian, which gives us a uh, expression in terms of nested commutator, which truncate at a given order, which is very nice because then we can actually calculate things exactly. We would then be summing, since we have this exponential answers, we would then be summing a specific type of correlations to infinite order. So we would be summing two particle, two whole excitations to infinite order, because when you do the exponential expansion, you get T2, plus T2 squared, plus T2 cubed, and so on and so on. So you will generate also four particle, four whole excitations, but not all of them, which you would generate by having a four particle, four whole operator. So the, um, the uh, truncation, which we are going to deal with, is a truncation of this type. So we are going now to solve the nonlinear equations by requiring that the overlap between the one particle, one hole, and zero particle, zero hole are equal to zero. And similarly, the equations for this one, you can get more ambitious and you can include the free particle, free hole. If I take up to n particle, n hole, I am back to that full non-practical way of writing the FCI equations, which I showed you before the break. So I hope this helps a little bit in seeing the wood for the trees. Or what is going to come now? Any questions so far? You said that this matrix is non emission. Yeah. So uh, if you would just switch around the bar we get, yeah. then, you, then we get would that be an equal with other like separate? Solve? You would have to solve that simultaneously. Yeah. Oh, so you have to solve yeah. both. Yeah. So the, you would have vectors which originally will not be orthogonal. So when you would have to solve both of them, and the they will not give the same result, as we will see. <laughs> so let me uh, go back. So I'm going to go back to the slides now a little bit. Let me just bring them up. So let me just take this one. Let me just go back. 
So I wanted to bring up some preliminaries here first. And uh, let's do that. So the um, uh, one thing which these slides, uh, this set of slides uh, has a, just a quick reminder of uh, uh, some of the things which we have gone before, uh, gone through before. So the um, uh, what we have done, uh, this can also function as a reminder when you're now looking at the midterm and also when you're going to uh, prepare yourself for the oral exam. Uh, what we have done is to define this uh, creation and annihilation operators with the uh, given uh, commutation relations for particle states and whole states. Another thing which we did was actually to define these operators and when we are now going to look at the couple cluster equations, we are going to deal with these normal ordered operators with respect to the new vacuum, to the reference state. So I just wanted to remind you of these quantities so that we are on the same page when we then move into the couple cluster equations. So when we did many body perturbation theory, we actually could switch between a normal ordered Hamiltonian with respect to the true vacuum, or we could define it with respect to the new vacuum. Yeah. But when you do copper cluster theory, we are just going to deal with the normal ordered Hamiltonian with respect to the reference state. Mm -hmm. So let me just quickly remind you of that. And you will, uh, we have seen these equations. Uh, let me, so when we look at the normal ordered operators, we don't need to go through all these details. But what we had, is a, uh, a operator F, which is now given, if we add a free body force interaction, we would have something like this, but we are going to skip that term. But we have a term which now is defined in terms of the uh, unperturbed Hamiltonian, plus something which uh, reflects the medium which we have. And when we were solving the Hartree-Fock equations, this was actually the Hamiltonian we were optimizing. And then the Hamiltonian which we would have is a Hamiltonian which now contains the original one minus this reference energy. And if we have, I just included this for completeness, if you have a free body interaction, then you would get an additional term here. But in most cases, we would stop at the second order, at, at the second term here, which corresponds to a Hamiltonian which contains a one body term and a two body term. And uh, uh, you would start typically with this Hamiltonian. So this is the one we we have been looking at again and again. And if you have a free body Hamiltonian in addition, you have this term here. And then by using these uh, contractions here, you could then rewrite this uh, one body part. So this is actually the type of contractions which we have been using now with taking into account particle and whole states. And then we could define a one body part where we have taken out the scalar part here. And then we would have a, let me just set this up here. Uh, I'm just gonna set it up. So, because we have gone through the derivations of this, and then we would have a two body part, which looks like this, and the one body part, which runs like that. And then we would have a uh, term, which is a scalar here. So that when we look at the two body Hamiltonian, we then have, this operator here, F, which does not include this scalar, which is the contribution from the reference state. And then we have a two-body part. So this is the Hamiltonian operator, which we are going to look at. So I just went a little bit quickly through it, just to quickly remind you of uh, uh, what we obtained in one of the exercises earlier in the semester. So that's the uh, uh, first piece. And then uh, I'm going back to a new set of... Uh, slides so let me just bring that up here just take that one i had these slides another place So let me just see if that pops up. It's not that one. 
All right. Let me just share properly again here. Okay, so the um, what we are going to do now is to uh, uh, truncate this wave operator at the level of uh, what we called two particle two hole, so which is normally called level two, and that defines uh, this copper class approximation to the to the wave function, and that means that we are going to have a, a, an operator which is now defined by the t one and t two here. Let's see what's going on here. And the, uh, uh, that means that what we are going to do next, when we now take the Hamiltonian, uh, which in our case is now limited to this uh, two-body Hamiltonian, so we have this uh, one-body piece, and then we have the two-body piece here, and this is a kind of sloppy notation where we just uh, skip putting in the two-body operator, and uh, some of you may have seen that in quantum chemistry. It's a pretty common notation. And this is to indicate that these are the normal ordered operators with respect to the new vacuum state, the reference state. And then we have this constant E0. And uh, as I said, these are things which we have already defined. Then what we are going to do now is to look first at a kind of diagrammatic way of doing this. And then we are going to look at the more linear algebra way of doing that. So we are going to contract uh, this uh, operator with the uh, wave operator T, these excitations, in all possible unique combinations that satisfy a given form. Uh, the diagram equation is the sum of all these diagrams. So we are going to contract uh, the operator with uh, uh, zero, one, or multiple operator elements. Uh, and these elements must at least have one contraction with uh, the Hamiltonian. And we are not going to allow uh, contractions between these uh, T operators. And a single T element can contract with a single element of this H in different ways. I'm going to show you then how we can actually put together things. So you can derive the equations from a diagrammatic point of view, and you can do it algebraically. So I thought of showing the algebraic way uh, a little bit more in detail tomorrow. So we are going to now uh, use the standard diagrammatic rules, which we have met before. So we have a particle line, which represents a contraction between second quantized operators. And external lines are connected to one operator vertex and in infinity. And internal lines are connected to operator vertices in both ends. And what you could think of now is your operator. So this will be your one body operator, which we have defined earlier. So when I say level minus one, that means I have a one particle, one whole state, which gets de-excited here. Here, level zero, particle state in, particle state out. Level zero is a particle, whole state in, whole state out. And then I have a creation of a one particle, one whole state. So I would call this a plus one level. So this is a way, so what I'm going to do now is actually bring diagrams together and use them as building blocks to set up the equations which I want to deal with. So horizontal dashed line segment with one vertex, excitation level, identify the number of particle hole pairs created by the operator. Then if I take the two body piece, the two body operator can now have a two particle, two hole, so this is excitation level minus two. So I take away two particle, two whole states. I have a uh, one particle, one whole state, which gets de-excited. I have a bystanding a particle coming in and leaving. So this is level minus one. This is with a whole state, level minus one. In this case, nothing happens with the no particle whole excitations. So I call this level zero. This is a one particle, one whole state which uh, gets annihilated here and gets created here. So I also call that level zero. And then I have a level zero like this. And this is a case where I create one particle, one whole state, same here. 
and then I have a level two here. So this is just all the possible ways I can now define my two-body Hamiltonian in terms of uh, particles and holes. And then what we're going to do is simply to, so this is my wave operator now, it's got all the Hamiltonian operator, and I'm going to connect that one with a wave operator in order to calculate expectation values. So let me try to uh, uh, show you a little bit with many body perturbation theory, what this actually could mean. So let's go back to the whiteboard so that you can see uh, the way we are thinking here. So if you look at many body perturbation theory, just to get a kind of feeling of what we have, Let's take second order in perturbation theory. So in second order perturbation theory, we have this guy here. And if we now write out the diagrammatic expression, the expression the, that was given by one over four, and now we put labels, A, B, I, J, and then we have a matrix element, I, J, V, A, B. And then we have A, B, V, I, J. And I'm going to put the denominator here, epsilon I plus epsilon J minus epsilon A minus epsilon B. So the way you would write this now is as follows. So we have a operator here. This is our two-body Hamiltonian. And this has level two. So I have a two-particle, two-hole state, which gets created. But then this gets de-excited later here. State here and here. So we perform the contractions with these guys. This operator here has a minus two as a level. So we de-excite a two particle, two whole state. So in principle, what we did in this case, if you look in more detail, we had the ground state here, phi zero. And that is now linked with the operator like this. And that produces this specific term, like that. And then in the beginning here, we had phi zero. And then this interacts with this operator and it produces this term here. So what we do now is that the interaction acts with the ground state and it produces a two particle, two whole excitation. <laughs> then there is a new interaction and this gets de-excited. Now, when you look at the uh, total excitation level here, it's plus two minus two, which is zero. So that means you go back to the same state. You can rewrite this now, if you look at this equation here, and if you now think of this as your amplitude Tij of AB, you can rewrite this in terms of one over four of A, B, I, J. And you have the matrix element for V of A, B of T, I, J of A, B. Okay. This is just to bring closer to copper cluster theory. This is the way it looks like in many body perturbation theory. But what I could do now instead of thinking of uh, this as an interaction matrix, this as a, an interaction matrix elements divided by denominator, I could think of this as an operator by itself. So I could think of this Tij here as now an operator which acts on the ground state. And then it simply produces a matrix element A, B, V, I, J, divided by epsilon i plus epsilon j minus epsilon a minus epsilon b. And this is the action of uh, 
this operator, Tij, AB, we can put a hat on it, acting on the ground state. So when we do money body perturbation theory to second order, this is just the interaction divided by denominator. But when you look at this uh, for more complicated type of uh, excitations, you can think of this T here as something which now contains more complicated correlations than just a two particle, two whole excited state. So when you keep iterating, next time this object here will contain more complicated two particle, two whole and other types of excitations. So what is common to do then in a diagrammatic way is to replace this term here with something like a bar like this. And then you have the type of excitation like this. So this is now your wave operator or the correlation operator as we called it in FCI. So this is the wave operator And in our case, this is now represented by this T2 guy. It's a two-particle, two-hole excitation. So if you look at money body perturbation theory, I could actually now, uh, if I do money body perturbation theory to second order, MBPP2, I could rewrite the diagram in the following way. Where this object which you have now, this specific term here, is now your two particle, two whole excitation, where you have the matrix element divided by a denominator. So this is a wave operator, so it should not have any dimensionality as we've seen. So it has the matrix elements divided by an energy denominator, so dimensionality is equal to zero. So energy divided by energy. So the, we could rewrite this diagram because if we did money body perturbation theory to second to third order, there would be a diagram which looks like this. But then what we could say, if we now have done an iteration here, we could say that this defines the wave operator and we could rewrite that if we have second order plus third order. We could now think of taking this term here, this one plus this one and just rewrite that one as a more general contribution which contains second order and, and third order. So the whole thing with copper cluster theory is that we have a systematic recipe to include these type of correlations, which you see here, of the two particle, two hole, to infinite order. If I go to fourth order, I would get further contributions. So that means that I can actually rewrite all these type of contributions here, which are just two particle, two whole excitations, I could sandwich them into this general expression here, or general diagram. So when you keep iterating the equations, you're going to include more and more complicated interactions. Does that sound? This is just the diagrammatic way of thinking, where you can then, uh, when you write a vertex like this, it means that now this is something which represents more than just a term to first, first order in the interaction. So it's going to contain terms which have been iterated upon so that you have uh, you some of these correlations are correlations which you can sum to infinite order. So this is the uh, basic uh, uh, philosophy behind what is coming now. So just keep this in mind if you do... Uh, money body perturbation theory to to second order you can always rewrite this term here in terms of what we called the wave operator to first order when you multiply that one with interaction to first order 
then you have an energy to second order. And you could have rewritten that term as well, just in terms of a wave operator. And the whole thing with copper cluster theory is that you have a recipe by which you can add more and more correlations to this T2 for every single iteration. Okay, let's go back to the uh, to these slides. And that's why we have these excitation levels as well. So if we take this one, what we have next here is that if we look at the wave operator, so if you now look at this bar here, this is then meant to represent uh, all kinds of excitations of the type of one particle, one hole, which are then included in this iteration here. So this would be a level plus one. And then you would have a wave operator, which looks like this, of level plus two. So when you're bringing together these excitations, when you go from the ground state to the ground state, which is the expectation value we want, then you have an excitation level of zero. Because then you have zero particle hole excitations, right? That means that when you bring together diagrams now, instead of doing the contractions, you're just looking at pieces of the operator and you just bring them together. And you want to end at an excitation level of zero because that's the final expectation value for the correlation energy. So what you do then, when you calculate this quantity here, you would have, uh, these are the elements of the wave operator, as you see here. And then uh, you have the ground state has no external lines. You just go from ground state to ground state and there are no particle hole excitations. So when you now are looking at these terms here, of excitation level plus one, you create a one particle, one hole pair. Here you have two particle, two hole pairs. And then you simply want now to change that, uh, so that, or not change, but you want to use this together with this to obtain something which has final excitation level equal to zero. So if you now look at the terms, this one, the last one, cannot link with any of these because that will give us an excitation level of plus four if I take this one together with that one. If I take this one together with that, that will give an excitation level of plus three. The same with this one, with that one would not work. But what I could have is this diagram here with that one. <coughs> Finally, if you now look at these guys, so I have no external lines, I cannot have this one, because you see this one can link with that one. Excitation level minus one plus one gives zero, but then I have two ex an external line coming in and going out, which is not represented in the ground state here. So the only th the terms which will match then will be this guy here. When I take now the calculation of T times H of N. So that's the same as if you now think of money body perturbation theory to second order, this term which I put up here, now I'll use this whiteboard here. It's a little bit easier. So if you now think of uh, money body perturbation theory to second order, this would be our A B V I J divided by the denominator. C is well. And then I need to link that one with the operator here. And if you now look at the, uh, the possible combinations, so there's no way I can link this one with something which looks like this. This would just be two disconnected terms here when I'm calculating an expectation value because now this is the same as the ground state with H of N. And this is now this operator T2 acting on phi zero. So what I want at the end is actually phi zero of H, this normal operator with T2 and phi zero. That's what I want. So when you now look at these terms, you will see this was just money body perturbation theory. But then when you look at the terms here, when you bring everything together, this is actually what we end up with. 
as the only possibilities because we have the uh, these two this guy here we can have two of these which can link with that one and that one so this is the way we would write down the diagrammatic contribution to the copper cluster energy with singles and doubles only with one particle one hole and two particle two hole excitations then so when you do the diagram rules and i think we should stop pretty soon here because so that you guys can grab some cake as well and then we're gonna uh, pick this up tomorrow and going to look at the derivations in more uh, i would say uh, on more algebraic form so let's stop uh, i'm gonna pause stop the recording here <laughs>